The first scripture reading today is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But as Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Thanks to God for the sharing of his word. The anthem the choir is going to sing today was written in October of this year. It was commissioned by the Chancel Choir in uh, honor of David uh, Robinson. Uh, David uh, was a founding member of the congregation here. Uh, for 10 years served as my predecessor as the choir director. And throughout the community, most people would probably know David as being the second president of Edison State College, a uh, very valued member of the, the music program, especially here. Uh, we have very fond memories of uh, David. Hope you'll enjoy the piece that we've commissioned uh, for him.
Amen. Thank you. And now we hear Matthew's version of the Christmas story. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Oh, thanks and praise be to God who gives us this word of hope and life and inspiration. May it be the guiding light in this, our Christmas season, and all the seasons of our lives. Amen. Once upon a time, almost 3,000 years ago, there lived a king, a great benevolent king, and the people of his kingdom loved him deeply. You see, he brought great prosperity to the land. And they praised him by calling him the chosen of God. And yet even with all that prosperity in the land, there was one cranky old prophet by the name of Amos who knew that there was still disparity out there among God's people. And he told the king and the people who loved their prosperity that a day of reckoning would come when the Lord would tear down both their summer houses on the mountain of the Lord and their winter houses down in the balmy desert below. You see, the people were so well off. They were so blessed. They had two houses and traveled between them. And they didn't understand what cranky old Amos meant. So they mostly ignored him. And they knew that if he kept up with this nonsense, the king's soldiers would eventually hassle him, maybe throw him in the dungeon, and shut him up. The years passed. The nation remained in its great prosperity. But this great beloved king contracted leprosy. And he had to hand the kingdom over to his son. Now, with no medical science, 
leprosy was considered a curse from God brought upon the wretched. And this confused the people. How can this be, they thought? How could it be that this benevolent king who's brought us great prosperity and has been so good, how could it be that he could be inflicted with the curse of God? Yet, the son's policies followed the policies of his father, and the prosperity continued. And when you have everything you need and more, you don't worry as much about those theological questions. You let them fall by the wayside. And they forgot about the old king because now they loved the king's son who was just as good. One day, that old king in isolation now died from his leprosy. And the person who was once his personal court prophet who is now serving his old king's son, remembered that king and went to the temple that day and mourned his king's death. And he recorded what happened. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. That was a moment that changed Isaiah's life forever. He had once been a noble court prophet for the king and then the king's son, But suddenly, in an instant, he became a cranky old prophet just like Amos from the hinterlands, the kind that he once despised. Because you see, confronting the presence of the Lord made Isaiah wonder about Amos, who talked about those summer and winter houses What did Amos mean, Isaiah thought? Do we worship wealth more than God? But the years passed, and Isaiah, court prophet of Uzziah's son, King Jotham, was an old man now when Jotham died. Isaiah had outlived two kings and was about to outlive the prosperity of that kingdom. Now Jotham's son Ahaz took the throne, but he was not like his father nor his grandfather before him. The Hebrew historians said that Ahaz Ahaz did things that were not pleasing to the Lord. And the day now came when a great emperor from the far north marched south with his armies. They destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel first, and then they marched into the southern kingdom of Judah, and they surrounded the Jerusalem walls, 
and you would stand on the walls and look out, and all you could see were the armies of this mighty emperor from the north. And Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the grandson of Uzziah, King Ahaz, was afraid. And he was willing to cut a deal with the army that was outside his gates. Isaiah, Isaiah told him not to, but he did anyway. He was willing to sell off his nation to the highest bidder that he might retain his power and his wealth and his fame. Disgusted, and finally, in his own moment of truth, like Amos, Isaiah made his own cranky prediction to the king. Look, he said, the Lord will give you a sign. Your wife is pregnant with a son, a king, and he will be called Emmanuel. Not you, he will be called Emmanuel. God is with us. Upon his birth, they gave that son the name Hezekiah. And he grew up, and he inherited his father's crown. And he would take the nation back. The summer and the winter houses were spared again for yet another generation. Almost a thousand years later, a different kind of prophet, in those days they called them gospel writers, a different kind of prophet named Matthew would remember Isaiah's promise to his people long ago. The nation was once again under the thumb of an evil empire, this time from the West. And his name was Caesar. But by this time, there were no summer houses or winter houses. Caesar had come and taken it all. And the king that they did have, his name was Herod. He was just Caesar's puppet. And like Ahaz before him, he did everything he could to appease the emperor and keep his wealth and power and fame. And like Isaiah had said to Ahaz so long ago, Matthew repeated the same words and the same prediction right in Herod's face. The Lord will give you a sign. A young woman is pregnant. He will be named Emmanuel. Because you see, God is with us again and has always been. But this time, the promise was not about summer houses and winter houses. The promise is not about the model car we drive or the trappings of national prosperity or the politics of what all that means. This time, the promise is about a greater hope that leads us beyond all the stuff beyond the world and its cycles of prosperity and crushing poverty and injustice. This is a different kingdom that cares little about the trappings and more about the people of God, the people who have always been sick and cast out and downtrodden and oppressed and poor. The child has been born to them. And this is their day. That's what Isaiah through Matthew says. That's why God, that's what God really means in our lives. And those with the equivalent of summer and winter houses 
must decide in their own hearts and in their own souls what Isaiah truly means. For you see, we live with the tension of two hopes in this season. Yes, we live with the hope that we can be secure. And if we are secure and safe, then we live with the hope that we can be comfortable. And after we are comfortable, we want to pass that security and that comfort on to our children and to our children's children. That's a common concern we all share in what we call our human condition. And you know, it's not a bad thing. It really isn't. But there is that other hope. A hope for eternal meaning and security that the hopes of this world can never answer. And with the same passion as our worldly hopes, we have to be as passionate to pass this along to our children and to our children's children telling them that if we ever have to choose between the two, this eternal hope must be the one that we choose above all else. For you see, God is with us now and always. Not in the shopping season that wants us to believe in other things. God is with us, but not necessarily with those who will go from here to Gulf Coast Town Center or the Coconut Point Mall, and most especially not with those who can't go there because they can't, and it's too painful to know that reality in their lives. And it's our job to proclaim the good news that is not painful, to proclaim the good news that is about hope, peace, joy, and love, to proclaim it, not just to say it, and that means we do say it, but we also show it. And when we do that, we will have fulfilled the word of that cranky old prophet Amos and Isaiah. 3,000 years in our past. Amen. Let us stand and say what we believe.